Good evening, everyone. I would like to begin this evening with a moment of acknowledgement. We would like to recognize the importance of the cultural, the role cultural institutions have in the formation of collective memory. As part of that work, we want to acknowledge that the Westmoreland Museum of American Art is situated upon the traditional lands of the Adena, Hopewell, Monongahela, Osage, Delaware, Shawnee, Seneca, and Seneca Cayuga peoples. We honor all of the indigenous nations and their land with great gratitude. As a museum of modern art, we use the power of art to explore and reveal the erasure of many lived experiences that comprise the complexity of American history. But a land acknowledgement is just the first step in supporting native peoples. And there are many ways to expand the support, including visiting exhibitions like Action Abstraction Redefined, Modern Native Art 1945 through 1975, that opened on February 26th and runs through May 28th, and attending programs like this one to learn more about Native history and Native peoples from Native peoples and Native-led institutions and organizations. Welcome to tonight's program, Thomas Indian School, Virtual Sovereignty, um, Sovereignty and Healing, which is generously supported by Art Bridges. My name is Hannah Vincent, and I am the Public Programs Manager at the Westmoreland Museum of American Art. I'd like to introduce our pres presenter, Hayden Haynes, Onondagua, Deer Clan. Hayden is a wonderful artist who uses deer antlers, photography, and other mediums to create his work, including the photographs we will be viewing tonight. So welcome, Hayden. Thank you, Hannah. <clears throat> Thank you, everybody. Uh, who is on the uh, call right now. Um, thank you to the Westmoreland uh, Museum of American Art for uh, having this, creating this space to, to have these conversations so that we can sort of uh, continue to create that common memory. Um, <clears throat> as, as Hannah said, um, I'm uh, Seneca, uh, which really means uh, people of the Great Hill. And I'm coming from, uh, to you from Cattaraugus territory, which is one of three territories of the Seneca Nation of Indians. And so I am a community member. I'm an artist. Uh, I do work at our nation museum uh, cultural center. And I am uh, very fortunate that uh, I'm going to share with you uh, th this photograph series. Um, that um, I, I did in 2021. And the, the photos that you're going to see are um, taken throughout uh, the Cattaraugus territory at these sites, locations, buildings, structures, uh, and a cemetery. And, and they really help um, provide a visual for these places that are that still exist today that we can still see and they're they exist right here on our uh, Cattaraugus territory. So um, oftentimes when folks talk about residential schools, um, or Native American residential schools, I should say, um, there is a uh, uh, conception or an idea maybe of um, these places existing, you know, off territories, which many of them, most of them did. Uh, this is a very unique one because this uh, institution existed right on our territory, right here in uh, Western New York. So I wanted to mention that that's what we'll be looking at today. Um, but I also do want to um, mention that I'm, I'm sharing what I know through reading and I'm sharing what um, with you um, conversations that I've had with knowledge holders, indigenous knowledge holders and indigenous scholars. Um, this photograph series that we're about to take a look at is um, started as just that. A photo series. Um, and then um, it's sort of uh, gained a lot of momentum through social media um, and uh, eventually became a full scale exhibition. And so I, I want to acknowledge some of those people, as I mentioned, that uh, shared with me their knowledge, these Indigenous scholars, a couple of whom are uh, Dr. Alyssa Mount Pleasant, um, Tuscarora, um, Dr. Lori Quigley, Seneca as well as many others. But I want to acknowledge uh, those people as being uh, the main uh, writers for the exhibition text. And, um, and their words are uh, super important. I also want to acknowledge community members who have shared with me and continue to share with me um, things that they know as well. 
Um, I did also want to um, mention that um, I want to be respectful because before we get into the photographs, I think we really need to uh, gain a little bit of historical context. For many of you, it's probably just a review, but um, this this institution that existed, as I mentioned, did not just you know uh, occur um, in the 1800s uh, out of nowhere. It's, it was the result of many events and policies um, that uh, brought brought that to uh, existence. And, and so that's what I want to touch on first. So bear with me. I'm going to actually try to uh, go through this. Um, long length of history fairly quickly um, because I think it provides a lot of insight as to, as to when we talk, start talking about the Thomas Indian School. Um, before I do that, I, I, again, I want to be respectful to uh, people's religions um, because a lot of what uh, I'm about to talk about has to do with uh, religion. and. Um, um, but it's important to get to go to that common memory, as, as Hannah mentioned in their in, the, in her opening statement, <clears throat> and is what I'll touch on at the end. So um, I encourage everybody to, um, you know, uh, take take those things um, as I say uh, for for those context reasons, so that we can uh, together uh, go through this timeline. Uh, but I want to make sure that everybody knows that we're. we're I'm attempting to do this in a respectful manner. If that makes sense. <clears throat> um, so starting starting with the religion, um, uh, as we know, um, the birth of uh, Jesus Christ is what you know. Uh, his life, his legacy, is what started uh, um, that that type of Christian church. Um, obviously, in, in the first century. Um, <clears throat> As, as the church uh, um, sort of was established and grew, um, an important event sort of happened uh, in the fourth century when Constantine, who was the emperor of Rome, um, became a Christian. And, and he sort of set out to, to Christianize uh, Rome. And so that, that's important. Um, because um, some people will say that, and it's quite evident, I guess, maybe that uh, that that is what established this um, Christian empire, which of course was not the intention uh, of Jesus, at least according to the, the readings that I've read. Um, so that's important to mention because, you know, empires behave um, in a certain way uh, to protect themselves but mostly to expand and so that's what began to happen <clears throat> uh, starting with uh, Constantine <coughs> in the 13th century again we're, we're covering a lot quickly but I, but I, I want to make sure that we cover this um, and there's other key events that happen too but I'm just sort of hitting on some high points <clears throat> 13th century Saint <clears throat> Aquinas or Aquinas I'm not sure of the proper pronunciation, so forgive me. Um, uh, develops this uh, just war theory, right? And it could be a response to, um, again, maybe the, I don't know if hypocritical is the right word, but um, stance or, or behaviors of this, em this empire. Uh, this just war theory uh, becomes established as a way to justify these actions of an empire. Um, and so what's interesting is in in uh, that time period, there's a there's a there's a a new word that sort of gets introduced into the to this rhetoric or and it, and it's the the term of an infidel. An infidel, uh, as it's sort of described um, in this context, is uh, somebody, who is less than human. Um, and we're going to talk more about uh, how that plays into 
everything else uh, as we move on. But that's that's where we hear this term of a, of an infidel, a less than human person, um, less than human being, I guess. <clears throat> and so um, <clears throat> uh, then becomes these uh, papal bulls. And for those who aren't um, aware of what a papal bull, those papal bulls are, these are you know official orders or proclamations issued by um, a pope. And so now we're skipping ahead even further. Now we're into uh, 1450, 1452, um, when a papal bull is issued um, stating, and, and, I'm, and I'm quoting, it says um, at this point that the people have full and free permission to invade, search out, capture, and subjugate any Saracens and pagans and any other unbeliever further goes on shortly thereafter to say, <clears throat> and to um, reduce their persons into perpetual servitude. That's sort of the basis um, of um, what then became a deep colonization of Africa and, and slavery. And um, that was in 1452. <clears throat> in 1453, uh, um, another papal bull was issued, and actually there was several papal bulls issued between 1452 and 1493. Um, and collectively, these are sort of what um, is known as the doctrine of discovery. So um, this serves as a basis of God-sanctioned um, uh, domination of people. Um, and it's really hard, right, to contend with something that is sanctioned by God. So, um, <clears throat> in 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 this term of discovery, right, oftentimes we hear people talk about, you know, Christopher Columbus discovered America, and and you know, it's kind of like a running joke, I guess, that you know, how how did he discover America when when you know, obviously there was already people uh, living over here. Uh, but I think that it has more to do with the, the way the, the reason the word discovery is just keeps getting put in there is because it's it's in reference to that doctrine of discovery because the the, the persons the country the empires that are in this case the Spanish are um, able to um, invade new lands and uh, enslave people vanquish them um, subdue them is because they have the authority, they have the God sanctioned right issued by these papal bulls to do so because they are the discovering people. So that's to me why it's important that we acknowledge what that discovery, that word means and how it plays into the discovery of America. It has to do with this, this um, doctrine of discovery and, and that God sanctioned um, initiative. <clears throat> So um, that sort of just sets the backdrop of what happens in the Americas. Um, an interesting and important thing, and yeah, it is, it is important. And it's also interesting because um, in the early 1600s, these French recollects and then these French uh, Jesuit missionaries, um, they, bec they become um, very uh, numerous and active in the uh, northeastern part of the what is now United States. And so um, they've also left a very um, 70 plus volume written account of their time with spent with the indigenous peoples. Um, a lot of what I've read uh, focuses on the, uh, the Wendat people, Wendat people, the, uh, or otherwise known as Huron people. And um, I think it's really telling if you read some of that stuff about, uh, again, the, the attitude towards these inhuman people, these subhuman people, um, as, 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 as I've already sort of outlined. What these French missionaries were doing was um, something that has continued on for centuries. One thing was the challenge, the customs and the, the beliefs and the, uh, for lack of a better word, religions of these communities. So they, 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 you can read for them yourself, but you know, they're challenging the healers in, the, um, in these communities. 
And what that's doing is that's causing a divide amongst the people between these people because they're they're working for converts. They're trying to convert these savages, these um, less than human people, into um, Christendom. And so, <clears throat> and they do that through a number of ways. A lot of it, again, in their own words, um, maybe not as bluntly, but using trickery. Okay, so an example of which is there's and there's so many we don't have time to get into, but I'll give you one example is where um, they were having challenges getting the uh, people to convert. And so they were bringing in these paintings of uh, Jesus, but the people couldn't identify to these paintings because uh, this Jesus um, was not, uh, did not look like them. So uh, they, they hired artists to create these different images, likenesses of Jesus, of Jesus that look more native. And so they're using these tactics, they're using these um, ways to sort of um, convince and, and sort of trick the indigenous peoples into believing in, in their faith. And of course, this is, all has to do with land, right? So we'll get more into that um, as we go on, but um, that's what this is all about. That's the doctrine of discovery is about, it's about land. That's what the Roman empire is about, it's about land. So we'll talk more about that. Uh, another thing that they would do is they would uh, withhold food for, from people in these communities who were not, uh, I guess, behaving the way that they felt like they should. And they were certainly, in terms of as, as specific it is to the uh, Wendat people, who, of course, uh, well, if, if you don't know, they're sort of a couple neighbors over from the Seneca peoples um, in Ontario, these, uh, this group of people, but they're Iroquois speaking group of people. And they are um, very similar in customs and beliefs. Um, and so another thing that they did was they would, um, through the French uh, government or, or military, control the use of control the trade of guns to these people. So that so um, these French and Indian wars and things that happen, you know, um, one might be able to argue that the tide could have been turned if these when that people were able or had more access to guns, but unfortunately they were, um, those um, things were withheld from them because they weren't um, converting and they weren't, um, they were challenging the priests and they were trying to hold on to their customs, the beliefs, their ceremonies, their ways of life. They were trying to just be themselves. So that's important. Um, <clears throat> And, and they've done some egregious things, again, so many throughout their own writings, in their own words. Another, I'll give one more example. Um, there was one thing that I read and they were talking about how they were um, performing these baptisms against the consent of, a, of, a, of the parents. There was, a, there was a baby, an infant that was dying due to disease. Because again, that's another thing that decimated our people was the introduction of these diseases. <clears throat> and um, the parents were, Telling the uh, the uh, missionary to not baptize their kid, their their infant, and all parties knew that the infant was dying because of disease. And so, as the as the missionary describes it, as the parents looked away, the uh, missionary uh, trickled some water on the infant's head and baptized them right there. So that, to me, is you know one of the most egregious things. That can be done and there are so many examples um you really have to be in a good frame of mind at least you know i do whenever i start reading into some of that stuff because it is just you know uh, it can it can be uh it can be uh, troubling to read to say the least so again what a, what that what all that did was create a division and this division is i'm talking about the when that but it, it it goes across the board with uh the rest of the hadina sony and the seneca creating this division, and we'll talk more about that as we go through um, uh, this, the rest of this power uh, presentation. In 1700s, um, there's more uh, more of the same in terms of the, the insatiable need for land, the insatiable want for, for land. Um, and, and then in 1763, as we all know, the, the, the king of uh, issues a uh, proclamation basically stating that, you know, settlers uh, can no longer, you know, claim and travel um, west of the Appalachian uh, Mountains, because um, there, was, there was a lot of friction between settlers and uh, indigenous folks at that time. So it issues this proclamation, and in some ways, it ends up 
um, being a catalyst for um, the Declaration of Independence because you know settlers wanted those lands. Um, you know, there was already land companies well established in surveying and in seeking out those lands. Um, so it was just a, a bad time on in what they call their frontier. Um, <clears throat> uh, and what's interesting, I guess, is in the Declaration of Independence, where it says all men are created equal, it also goes on to state um, that, um, well, it makes reference to what they call the merciless Indian savages. Um, so again, there's another sort of reference to the subhuman group of people. You know, all men are created, created equal. And I guess they were sort of right in the sense because their definition of men was quite literal, I think. Um, there's no mention um, in the uh, in the preamble um, or, or the Constitution of the United States of uh, Indigenous folks. They're excluded. Um, initially, the, the women are completely excluded. Blacks, they're they're considered three three fifths of a human being. Um, and so again, it's 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 about all men are created equal, and it's referring to white land holding men is really what it is. And so this is, again, about land. It's about um, ensuring that the, the, the white males have the power and the land, and um, everybody else is sort of subhuman, um, at least the indigenous folks and the black. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and of course, later on, the 14th Amendment, you know, restores some or gives some sort of uh, rights, but it does not give the right uh, to vote to women. There's still no um, inclusion of native people. So that's, that's interesting. Um, as we move forward, we're getting closer to PIS, I promise. Um, what has what ends up happening is um, the United States develops this civilization uh, policy and it's sort of spearheaded by this uh, Secretary of War, Mr. Henry Knox, um, <clears throat> after he writes this report on Indian uh, on Indian policies or the status of the Indian people, especially in the Ohio country, where there again there was still all that friction happening on the settlers, etc. Um, <clears throat> through a number of treaties, and there's not enough time to get into all of them because there's so many with so many different nations. Um, the Seneca folks in particular, Hadina Sony, um, there was a series of uh, treaties at Buffalo Creek, but uh, a Buffalo Creek, the Buffalo Creek territory, which, you know, has long has since been uh, taken or gone, I found, is, is uh, where a lot of our people in the early 1800s were living. Not just Hadina Sony people, but, you know, that's the thing is we have to remember that there's a lot of folks involved in these things, uh, a lot of nations, um, communities living together, Blacks, uh, non-Natives, uh, many different nations, and Buffalo Creek was no exception. Um, in Buffalo Creek, there was a couple of missionaries, and that's where they established a school. And as, again, Dr. Alyssa Mount Pleasant, who I mentioned before, has um, stated, there was a decade of debate over um, establishing this school on the Buffalo Creek territory. And it caused, again, a huge division, but there was already a division, but it created a, a further division that goes back to what happened with the Wendat and our own people, um, which I haven't mentioned. So this division amongst our people is a result of these missionaries of this trying to Christianize our people, try to take away our languages and our ceremonies. And so I guess what happens is because of the state of the Indians, in the civilization policies determined that we, there was a need to expedite this process to get those lands quicker, right? Because in the 1800s, um, the common uh, belief is that this was the century of expansion for the United States when really it was really um, a century of extreme uh, sadness for indigenous folks as they were forcibly removed. Um, and uh, so on. So there was a missionary up in the Buffalo Creek territory. I'm trying to get us further along, bear with me. Um, <clears throat> his name was uh, the Reverend Ashley Wright and he had a wife, his, her name is Laura. Well, later on he had a wife named Laura. Um, 
and he was a Presbyterian missionary, as I stated. So after these, um, the losses of these, several of our territories through these treaties, um, many of our folks came down to Cattaraugus, which is where I lived, including Mr. Reverend Asher Wright. And he established a um, mission, uh, mission house down here on the territory and began, you know, doing his missionary work. So <clears throat> in, in 1847, uh, a, a large typhoid fever um, broke out in Cattaraugus. Um, and that resulted in parents being lost and all these uh, children, as they described them, um, you know, they were orphaned. But they also stated that um, there was also a need because there's a lot of destitute children and so um what what became of that is they reverend asher wright and his wife laura began taking in these children because they were orphaned and destitute and so he began to take them into his mission house which we'll see in a minute um eventually i guess we can skip ahead to two slides please two slides um that was in 1847. okay now we have a, a different visual for you, so thank you. Um, I'm sorry that took so long. Um, so here we have Jocelyn, as I mentioned, and she is standing in front of a marker in front of the um, Wright Memorial Church. That's reference to Asher Wright. And that's the church down on our territory that still stands. Um, and, that, and Jocelyn Jones here is a Seneca uh, culture bearer, language speaker, educator, model, and, a, and but more importantly, she's a human being. And so um, what I did in this photograph is I obviously uh, blackened out everything and, and kept her orange dress, um, her, her traditional regalia. And so that color orange is, most people know is associated with the um, Every Child Matters movement. Um, that was because um, that was sort of, I guess, started by Phyllis Webstead, who is still alive. That just goes to show that these uh, schools and these institutions are they're not far removed from them. Um, she tells her she told a story, and it was a story of like many other folks. But in her story, she was told that as a child that she was going to be going to this school, and she was super excited, you know, perhaps naive, um, not knowing what was in store for her. Before she left uh, to go on her long journey to the school. Her grandmother had gifted her this really shiny uh, orange shirt. And, um, you know, like many folks at the time in those communities was not, she did not, you know, having nice things like that and getting gifts like that wasn't something that happened often. So, and her grandmother gave it to her. So she was especially fond of that shirt. So she's excited because she's getting this shirt. She's getting ready to leave, to go to the school. It's going to be amazing. And then when she gets there, she realizes that it's nothing like she thought it was going to be. And it's a residential school for Native people in British Columbia. And what happened is the nuns had taken her favorite shirt, the orange shirt uh, that her grandmother gave her, and uh, she was never able to get it back. And they did other things as well. Um, so that's part of the idea, right, is to expedite this process of um, if our Natives are not becoming assimilated fast enough, and if this land is not becoming more readily available fast enough, better tactic, I guess, in their eyes in the United States is what I'm speaking of, would be to um, start with the children. It's hard to convince um, an adult or an elder that their way is wrong and that they need to uh, start practicing these other things. It's much easier to take a child, remove them from their, um, remove them from their uh, communities, from the people that can influence them as they've written about. Um, and so that they can institutionalize them in these military-like schools. And so that's what that orange uh, shirt story is about. And that's what that orange shirt movement's about. And that's, um, oh, Jocelyn is wearing this orange shirt. What's super interesting is when I asked Jocelyn to take these photos, um, we didn't really talk a whole lot about anything really other than just some photos. And so she had a few different um, outfits and she actually ended up wearing this one and it had just happened to be orange. So it's kind of interesting how that happened like that. So here we are at one location where Asher Wright has done some missionary work in a building that still exists. Next slide, please. And here she is sitting on the steps of this 
enormous church. And so I think hopefully maybe what people can get as we go through these is um, I'll tell you a little bit about the day. Again, we didn't really talk about it a lot. I made those earrings. They're, they're antler earrings that are made out of um, moose antler. And I made them in, in uh, sort of response to the Kamloops discoveries of those mass graves. And I wanted to take an opportunity to um, educate our community first about the school, these sites. Because as a child, me growing up myself, I didn't know about the, 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 the connections to all these places. These are places that we drive by nearly every single day. So it was a, it was a way to, through social media, to educate our, our uh, community our children, et cetera, about this school. So we can talk about healing. And so um, Jocelyn was in the same boat as far as she didn't, she didn't know at the time um, where I was taking her, why. So as we're going through this stuff, um, these places and visiting them, I'm talking to her about the stuff that I'm talking to you folks about. And I'm telling her, you know, she, she had a, a information about, um, Thomas Indian School, but connecting the dots was different. And I tried to provide her with some deeper meaning or some deeper knowledge about it. And so what you'll see, hopefully, is some of these emotions coming out of her. Because this is all really emotions. I was just taking the photos and she was just sort of walking around and I was talking to her and we were talking back and forth. And some real emotion, I feel like, was uh, captured. Um, maybe you'll, some of that will come through. Next slide, please. And so this is the lower mission house. It's all boarded up in this disrepair. Um, it's it's about probably a mile or so from the uh, Wright Memorial Church, the one that we were just looking at. Um, next slide, please. And this was a powerful moment, maybe, for me at least, and for, through Jocelyn, we've talked about this since. A lot about this actually this day, but um, this door, right? This is where you know um, threshold of where uh, children were left with these missionaries, to uh, who uh, in 1855 established the Thomas Asylum for Orphan and Destitute Children. So, um, as, as a private institution, um, as an act passed by the New York by New York State to establish this, because again fever or typhoid fever, other diseases, and also destitution of children uh, in the communities were taken in to this uh, structure. And that's a huge moment. I feel like it was a huge moment for her. It was a moment for me. I didn't realize at the time until uh, after. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, here is on the porch of the same structure where I feel like, uh, and, and she sort of said the same thing, she's uh, sort of grasping with the magnitude of, of that, uh, that place in the, the memory there. Uh, next slide, please. And this is just another uh, photo of the, of the scene. So again, now in um, 1855, as I mentioned, this, uh, private institution is established to these uh, Presbyterian uh, missionary and his wife. And if we go on to the next slide, <clears throat> eventually that institution becomes um, uh, in 1905 or 1875, I should say, under the New York State Board of Charities and eventually becomes named the Thomas Indian School. And so after that happens, they, or when this happens, there's these giant uh, brick structures that replace. So initially it starts off as, as the mission house, and then they move into this wooden structure a few years, few years later. And then after um, becoming under the state total control, then it'd be then these uh, this large campus of dozens of these huge brick buildings um, be, be get, begin to get erected. And so this building here in particular, there's only a few of these left standing. This one has been refurbished by the Seneca Nation of Indians. It's where the tribal courts are at the moment. And so it's in use. And this is the old infirmary um, where, um, I mean, you can use your imagination, the type of things that uh, happened there and the tragedies that fell uh, children there. And so 
in some of the writings of people that visit, uh, I'm talking about people that are um, employees or, you know, yeah, employees of like New York State for diff in different capacities visiting this campus. In some instances, they're writing about how they're surprised that when they go there, that the windows are all um, um, barred as in a jail, right? Because our children are referred to as inmates here in their writing, in the writing to the superintendents and just in general and in many other institutions. So I guess they, well, they tried to say that, well, they are like this because they're boarded in like this or they're barred in because um, so they won't escape and, or it's definitely a fire hazard. It's definitely a safety hazard. So our, that's that's um, a little bit about that building. And this was again, around the time of Kamloops. So I, as you see in the front there, there's a bunch of things and you can't really see them too well, but they're different uh, teddy bears, shoes, things like that, that our community come and they left uh, at that building um, as our communities began to really look at this uh, place again. Next slide, please. And uh, this was to me an interesting moment where, uh, you know, Jocelyn is looking into this window. And so I, I, I colorized her, her reflection as she's sort of, again, we're talking, she's exploring, she's listening, um, and she's reflecting. And I think that's kind of telling as to the people that were in there and the self-reflection of ourselves as indigenous people today as we're trying to heal, and we're trying to get past this time period. Um, next slide, please. And this is, um, you can't see the full tree here, but it's a very large tree, a couple hundred years old, I would say. And it's casting this shadow again. That's the same building. That's the old infirmary, which is now the tribal court building. Um, and uh, next slide, please. That's more of the tree there. You know, when I was thinking about that tree afterwards, I was looking at these photos, I was thinking about the, the, the children that, you know, had um, played played around that tree, you know, played games around their tag, whatever, hide and seek. And it's just interesting or and reflecting on what life was like for those kids there. Now, eventually that place did become more of like a day school where uh, some kids um, would go home to their territory if they were from there, they had family there and um, <clears throat> spend time with their family in that sense and go back for a uh, you know, day school. Um, other folks from other indigenous people. So it wasn't just the Seneca, it wasn't just the Hadina Sony people that went there. Uh, as a matter of fact, this exhibition that I mentioned that, you know, uh, we, we created after these, the series of photographs recently traveled to the Shinnecock Nation um, because they have um, long history, shared history with us of our people attending that school. So many different nations, it wasn't just Seneca, it just wasn't Hadina Sony. Um, I wanted to share that too. Next slide, please. And so this is the United Missions Cemetery, which is right across the road. Oh, I forgot to mention that that TIS um, infirmary that we were just looking at is um, maybe a quarter mile from the lower mission house. So all these buildings that we're looking at, the furthest one away was the, um, the church, which was about, again, like a mile away. The rest of these are pretty close. They're walking distance for sure. This cemetery is right across the street from the lower mission house that we first looked at. Uh, next slide, please. So in this cemetery, and this wasn't something that um, Jocelyn knew until we were there, that there's this, uh, the grave site of Asher Wright and um, Laura Wright. And you can vaguely sort of see their photos on there. And it's got this old iron fence that's wrapping around it, obviously. And uh, I just, you know, took this photo as she was looking at it and facing, you know, those people. Um, not just the people. Uh, I think it, a lot of it has to do with um, all the stuff that we already talked about. The generations of our people that have been um, our communities, our, our history has been, the trajectory of it has been greatly changed due to missionaries and and it was all purposeful there was it, it wasn't uh, a byproduct of just goodwill 
I mean, I'm, I'm sure there was some missionaries that, you know, had, had better intentions than others. But the reality of it is the funding for those missionaries to, to live in these places like, quote unquote, New France and all these other places are funded by these uh, bigger entities, countries that are have these other plans in mind. And so, you know, I think it was just for me an interesting moment where she's facing, she's facing all of that. She's because she never, she didn't know that that, that gravesite was there. In in her words, um, she was a bit angered that the rest of that cemetery, where there are unmarked graves, um, where there are other just regular community graves too, it's not just that, are have this, you know, I guess you could call it nice uh, stone tombstone, and <clears throat> this fence around there. Uh, you know, it was she, she had a lot of emotion. Next slide, please. And this is just another capture of some of those emotions. So again, you know, this was just a casual day of talking and it wasn't something where we planned all these things out and, you know, it was just very organic. And uh, I think that's what made it, uh, in my opinion, sort of impactful. Um, next slide, please. This is just another uh, tombstone at the same cemetery. All right, next slide. This is the last photo that we uh, took that day. And as we were leaving, that was the last stop we made too. And um, the sun is setting, as you can sort of see. And, you know, she just was wandering and uh, thinking. I think she was more thinking. Uh, and uh, there was these uh, white, or I'm sorry, orange tiger lilies that grow wild in there. And uh, she just happened to <clears throat> stoop down and uh, pick pick one. And uh, she was just kind of looking at it. And of course, orange, the association with the red, or I'm sorry, the orange shirt movement. Um, and you can see the tombstones in the background. So uh, this one full color, obviously, because, um, you know, we've taken all that in, right? We've and, and, and today we've talked about a lot of different stuff <clears throat> uh, the history and not just the school but even before that and so now what right i've read a, i've read some books and i've read one book in particular that about tis that uh i feel is really damaging because it doesn't really leave any room for healing but see that's what happens when in my opinion uh, communities are not involved in some of those processes so that's why the title of this talk is Narrative Sovereignty, because what I wanted to do with this photo series, and I didn't realize that it was going to take on a life of its own, but what I wanted to do was to educate our community and use it as a chance to tell the story in our words. Um, there's been books written, there's been careers um, uplifted because of, you know, things like the Thomas Indian School by non-Native folks who did not consultate with um, communities they're telling our story and these are very traumatic things that our people are still dealing with um and and so i i encourage folks that if you know we we have to have the scholars i agree 100 percent. and there's a lot of good indigenous ones out there too I mean, hopefully those folks are involved in whatever things i don't know who's on the call but you know it's important we, and it's also important that we include our communities because the people that are living amongst um our community have a pulse on what's going on and what the what the mood is, and so um, I think that's important. And in some cases, like in this one book I'm, I'm talking about, consultation was granted, but it was only in it as a way to extract these stories. And so the stories, these bad stories of sexual abuse at the Thomas Indian School, which have been well documented through um, the Buffalo Inquirer, for example of uh, sexual abuse and, and rape and of uh, indigenous women that are that went to thomas indian school to the horrible food that was served at the thomas indian school to the children while while the um staff and and, and other folks got the better of the meals uh, particularly like of uh, the skimming of the milk and in uh, better portions and our, the wormy food that our children were made to eat out of necessity really and in a lot of ways our children at, at some time periods in that school were making um, things for for sale 
So our, it was basically like a child labor issue too going on at the school where our children were making things, but they weren't seeing any of the actual profits. It was going into the institution or people's pockets within the institution. And so that's another story. Oftentimes, um, and these are all things that are part of the exhibit, I'm just gonna touch on briefly. Um, the application is quite, uh, I, I don't know the word, uh, sad that um, when these children are going to these, uh, going to Th Thomas Indian School, the parents have to relinquish lots of rights. They're, they're forced to sign these children away, basically, and the monies that are owed to them through the, to the federal government has now become property of um, the institution. So the families don't get them money. The children doesn't go to the children anymore. It becomes property of the institution. And so that's that's a whole nother thing. But now we're at the point where we're talking about healing. Um, and because generational trauma and historical trauma are a real thing, and it's been proven that uh, can some of this stuff can be passed down through um, genetics. Right, so we haven't touched on any of the other stuff other than missionaries and this residential boarding school stuff. But there is so much trauma that our people are uh, dealing with still, and many people are recognizing this and have been for a long time. So we're not like the first people to like talk about this um, with this exhibit. You know, our communities have been talking about this for a long time. Our ancestors, and so <clears throat> this is we're we're just one other couple group of people that have done this. Um, so we have to acknowledge uh, that too. Um, there's a high rate, as we all know, um, and I'm not gonna generalize indigenous communities, but communities of our people of suicide, um, alcoholism, drug abuse, sexual abuse. And, you know, we've had community conversations, like formal ones, I should say, like through the Rockwell Museum, um, they sponsored one, um, and um, this is where we talk about stuff like this as a community. Um, people, including myself, I'll speak for myself, identify a lot of the struggles that I've had in my life in adulthood, and I can see these um, direct lines to my ancestors and my grand, my great grandparents, and my great great aunt and my great great uncle attending Thomas Indian School or the Tenessa or whatever schools that um, our ancestors attended. That you know, that's where a lot of this stuff, as one and small example, but an important one comes from. And so now our communities are talking about this stuff, and it's a touchy subject uh, for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to even talk about this stuff, but. Um, as a result, we are working on our healing and our well-being of our people and revitalizing our ceremonies, our arts and our crafts, our language, stuff that our ancestors have been doing for centuries. They've been holding on to what the missionaries have tried to take from us, right? Because if we don't have, if we are a distinct people, you know, the federal government won't recognize us as such and they'll have the authority to come and take our land. You know, something that's still on the books is this termination policy that happened in the 1950s. And that's a real thing to terminate um, tribal nations uh, as as they are. And it's just uh, something we have to be mindful of. Um, in the 1970s, um, there was IHS became, which is the Indian Health Services for the, that's ran by the federal government, um, put in place as a way to uh, part of these, some of these treaties. Um, were sterilizing women and it became um, sterilizing indigenous women um, without their consent. And so again, um, they point they pointed to poverty once it all came out that that's the reason why they were sterilizing these women without their indigenous women without their consent um, because there was too much children, too much poverty. Women were having too many kids. It was the cause of the poverty, not not in our territory, but that was you know elsewhere. And so. <clears throat> That all, all of this kind of goes back to the dehumanization, the subhumanness that still exists amongst our people. You know, um, the lack of rights that our people have um, and the policies set forth by the United States are all things to um, keep uh, these, um, this, this narrative or this idea of subhuman people. 
in 2005, I think was one of the most recent ones where the doctrine of discovery was actually referenced by the Supreme Court. So this is, you know, we're talking about the 1950s and the 1970s. This, it's still there. It's still there. And so if, if we're holding on to the doctrine of discovery, then we're holding on to the fact that Native peoples are um, not human. And as such, we have no rights. Our rights exist in, in according to um, precedents set by the state, uh, the Supreme Court in different court cases, primarily the one in uh, 1823, Johnson versus McIntosh. Um, we only have the right of occupancy of land. We don't have the right to own land. The right to own land goes by the discoverer, which is again, a reference to discovery, Christopher Columbus, the discoverer of the land, the government and the possessor, um, which the government has set that precedent in that case that I mentioned, Johnson versus McIntosh, um, set a legal precedent for us as indigenous peoples that we only have the right to occupy land, uh, kind of like, you know, a deer um, lives on land. Um, deer, the deer can't own the land um, as in, in that type of ideology, I guess. It can just live there. The land belongs to someone else. And so that's a problem. And it's still, it's still there. Um, but one of the things that I appreciate when we talk about this stuff is places like the West Moreland and you folks that are listening that to have these conversations um, and to create these spaces, right? Because that's what we need. We need spaces to be able to do these things. And one of the ways that our people are um, continuing to heal um, is by reestablishing some of our roles in, in our communities and our society, right? Because the missionaries and the European way of societal roles and maybe gender roles, if you want to go to that uh, that far, is a complete opposite of what our people, the Hadina Sony people, was believed, where the women worked the land, the women were the owners of the land and still are, because even to this day for the Seneca Nation of Indians, if the Seneca Nation wanted to sell a piece of land, for example, to um, the federal government, they need um, a majority vote by the mothers of the nation. To this day, that's still that's still a law within the Seneca Nation. So that just goes to show that, you know, that's still important to our people. Our women own the land, whereas the Europeans wanted the men to, to work the land. Of course, the men definitely own the land. That was a that was a driving point of how our people needed to change. If the men needed to own the land, the women needed to just do husbandry skills and, and housekeeping skills, and they didn't have a say. They, they wanted us to mirror what they did, but in actuality, what it was was the complete opposite of what we did. So that's more of that disruption that I mentioned. That's why our people struggled with this stuff so much and fought against these things so much. Oftentimes, our people are um, described as just these uh, barbarous people who, you know, were doing these things. And certainly, are, when war happens, things happen on both sides. And uh, I'm not disputing that. What I'm saying is, um, our people are just fighting for our, our rights, not just our not just the land and the territory. Our people were fighting for those types of things for our our women to be able to care for the land in the way that only they really know how to do. Um and the caretakers of our villages and in those governmental ways that we operated, those uh the Hadina Sony Confederacy, for example. So that's all what our peoples are continuing to do today is hold on to those things and and uh and sort of realign those with our selves. And so a lot of the work that I do, if you follow me on social media or, or just my work in general, a lot of what I do is about uh, highlighting our women, uplifting our, uplifting our women's voices and, um, and making sure that they, that, uh, I create a space, creating spaces that, that I can for them. Um, next slide, please. So, that's all I have on the Thomas Indian School stuff. But what I wanted to share with you guys is some artwork that was created in response to the photograph series by Adina Sony people. On the left side here, we have a mixed media piece by Samantha Jacobs. It's a Jack in the Box, obviously, and it's got this mother holding a child. It's, there's four sides. You can only see one there, but it's pretty amazing. On the right side, we got a pot that was made by uh, Peter Jones. <laughs> Excuse me. Next slide, please. This is a uh, pen and ink by Randy Spruce uh, called The uh, Children Are Going Home. 
<clears throat> you can see the reference there with the uh, orange. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Um, this is a large piece by uh, Seneca artist uh, Luann Redeye. And I encourage everybody to look these folks up. Samantha Jacobs, Peter B. Jones, which most people know who he is, uh, Randy Spruce, Luann Redeye. Um, but what you can't see in this very large thing is all these um, names. So what she did is she looked up hundreds, probably a couple of thousand names, and she wrote them in there. And that's what those little obscure lines are that you see. Those are names of people that attended the Thomas Indian School. And so what this um, person is doing is building this clay vessel. And so that's like in reference, maybe, maybe, I don't know. I'm just using my interpretation to rebuilding um, those roles and also rebuilding our healing and continuing on rebuilding ourselves back up. Because in our culture, uh, on a side note, um, in our origin story, the, in, in one version, I should say, the uh, creator made us out of dirt and then blew uh, his breath into us. And that's what made us become alive. And so clay is closely referenced in, in that regard too. Next slide. This is a large digital piece made by Tammy Watt, who's also Seneca. Um, as you can see that on the bottom there, that building is um, based off of one of the existing Thomas Indian School brick structures. And um, what that language means um, up there is, um, actually, you know what? I can't remember exactly. I don't want to say, I don't want to get it wrong. Next slide, please. This is the, the first showing of that exhibit, which opened in 2021 also. So we put this together. Again, I say we because it wasn't me. It was a group of us. Um, and, and it opened up at the Sully Huff Cultural Center on the Cataract Territory, which is right next door to the Lower Mission House. And was part of a campus at one point for the Thomas Indian School, the outside of skirts of it. And so you can't see this, but there's a line out the door there. And so that line was there for probably four hours. I don't know, I had to leave just because it was just, there was a lot of people and there was no need for me to just stand around. But um, that line went around that thing for four hours or so before this walk, this healing walk that happened, which took place on Cataraugus and it went around the different sites that you guys have seen, the, the old infirmary, of course, it walked past the lower mission house and, and the uh, this United Mission Cemetery was you know in view, but not past it. Next slide, please. And here's in a, from the walk itself. And again, you can't see it all, but where I'm at in this picture is kind of towards the front, which you can see there in this snaking row of people. There was about 700 people that came off of that inaugural, I guess you want to call it that, TIS walk and exhibit showing. And so that's what was most meaningful uh, for me as it pertains to the exhibit was to create that um, to tell that story um, for our community so that our community can know a little bit more about it. Next slide, please. And there is, there's more of, there's more of the snaking. Behind that sign on your right-hand side, there's another, which is wrapping around that giant building. There's a whole nother stream of people and that just goes to show like how long that line was with that walk. Next uh, slide, please. All right, Yawe, thank you guys for listening. Um, I hope that you were able to take something out of that. Um, I'll turn it back over to uh, Anna. All right, thank you so much, Hayden. That was really a wonderful presentation. Um, I want to open um, the chat now for any questions that folks have. So feel free to put your questions in the chat for Hayden. Um, I did have somebody ask a question. Dolores Tanglin said, not directly related, but I would be interested in Mr. Haynes' impression of the portrayal of the boarding schools in the TV series 1923. I'm not sure if you've seen that before, but have you? I, I have not seen it. I have not seen it. Okay. But to me, um, and again, I haven't seen it. Maybe it, it does, and I don't know. Um, but just in general, anytime I, for me, in my opinion, because again, you know, I'm not an expert in all this stuff. I'm a community member who's passionate about uh, our community. And I feel like 
when these conversations head, whether it's through um, these documentaries, these movies, a book, a talk, whatever, you know, the emphasis on the healing aspect of it too, because you don't want to just, you know, talk about the bad. We, we want to talk about what our people are doing now and how they're healing and, the, and celebrate our people's resiliency and celebrate our people's strength. You know, that's what we, you know, I, I, I sort of mentioned where I work. Um, I, I don't like to get into that when I do talks like these, but oftentimes I, I, we get questions or apologies from people um, about what happened. And you know what, in the end, we just want people, I'm talking about where I work and talking about myself to just, you know, uh, have the shared history that we didn't talk about. There's a quote that I wanted to share with you. And it's not an exact quote because I couldn't find it, but I got the general quote. And it's something that I, that you alluded to in your statement that I wanted to talk about in the beginning. And it's by George, George R. Erasmus. And he, this was something that he said when he was writing for the Truth and Reconciliation as it pertains to the stuff we're talking about for Canada. And, and this is why it's important that we talk and, and have these conversations together, Indigenous folks, non-Indigenous folks, et cetera, because this is what he said. <clears throat> where common memory is lacking, where people do not share on the same path, there can be no real history or no real community. If you want to build a community, you have to start by creating a common memory. And so when we talk about this stuff, when I talk with folks about this, that's what I hope that people get out of it is having a common memory. This is stuff you're not going to learn about in school, obviously, in, in, in you know, regular K-12. So. Um, Sorry, but that's that's too much for the question. We do have a question too from Bonnie Anderson. Um, Bonnie said, what informative talk? Where on the Cataraugus Nation is the school? Is it in Salamanca? Um, it's on the other one, which is a little bit north of uh, the Allegheny Territory. It's about 20 minutes south of Buffalo, 25 minutes south of Buffalo. So do you live close to this area? I live right on the Cataraugus territory. I mean, the TIS grounds are, are like a two minute drive from my house. Yeah. Really? And you said that you grew up, I know um, you had mentioned you grew up like playing by this tree that you ended up taking a photograph of. So when you were younger, what was your impression of, of this school, of this place in your town? See, <clears throat> again, some a lot of our folks in our community don't like to talk about this stuff. So we had to be sensitive to that too. That's why when we did this exhibition, um, the writers um, and we all agreed that we weren't going to tell stories like that one book I mentioned, which I don't want to even mention it by title to give it any recognition. We're not going to tell these tragic stories um, as they were related by those people or their family members out of respect, right? That's where the community connection is. It's easy to come in from outsider and just gather, extract all this horrible stuff and then go and sell it. You know, we had to be respectful. So we said, we're not telling those personal stories. Um, and uh, yeah, it's my memory, could, again, it's going back to the question, I'm sorry, um, to create the exhibit or to create this series with the educate our community, because as I mentioned, I didn't grow up learning, knowing this stuff. So that infirmary that I mentioned before was fixed up by a second nation when I was a child was just an old, building that you could go in and as young kids did back then before there was things like internet and stuff like that we actually like played in there and stuff like that and it was just um there was just garbage and trash in there and it was just an old rundown building and that's all we knew it was is, oh yeah it used to be a school but nobody knew anything about it yeah, mm. yeah. Well, at least i didn't yeah um dolores tenglin said agree about the healing and resiliency aspect the series is not done yet, so it remains to be unseen if they bring that in, referring to 1923. So another question I have, um, you as an artist, and I put um, Hayden's website in the chat, and I really recommend you check it out. Wonderful works of art and, and multiple different um, mediums. How does your art kind of help you like traverse um these conversations and your own lived experience oh you're on mute sorry that's um, okay <laughs> that's um 
I want to first mention like the power of art. So initially it started before it was even a photo series, <clears throat> I, which then became this exhibition. I made those comb earrings, right? And these comb earrings are, what I do is I primarily carve antler. And antler is a traditional medium used by peoples across the globe, right? For utilitarian purposes, mostly predates all other things with the exception of probably um, bone and stone. Yet what I've found is that um, th once I started carving bone and antler is that it's severely marginalized in the native art world as being something that isn't traditional, right? Oftentimes, at least in the circles that I am aware of, things like beadwork and basketry, those are things that are celebrated as these traditional arts. And what I have found is that there is this pushback about your carving antlers. What is that? Even though there's references to the material all throughout our history and our and our oral history and our stories, right? In one version of, of our creation story, the first object ever mentioned was a bone comb because these combs, that's what those earrings were, they're, they're um, uh, symbols, they're, they're tools of transformation. So in our culture, um, they could be used for a number, no, no, uh, number of things. One could be inducing fertility, which goes to the creation story. The first object that ever mentioned was a comb that induced fertility of the mother of Sky Woman. So that's important um a reference and um and also things of transformation in terms of healing mental distress or mental anguish whether it be depression um things of that sort um so these are tools that are still used today by people to do um, certain you know ceremonies healing ceremonies so that's why i thought it was fitting to do these comb earrings that had these figures of these uh what i would call them as children they're just kind of figures um that had to do with the residential school this transformation this changing this healing from that. And so um, that's why it was important. So that's the power of art. That's how it started. And then I I made these earrings and I and then I had an idea to do the social media thing, which then turned into this whole other thing, which then turns into uh, several other things, which leads me to talking to you guys today. So that's, you know, important um, in that regard, the example of what something like an ed can do. And, but I still receive pushback from uh, folks who don't consider antler carving as a traditional art, even though I could spend three hours talking to you guys right now and give you examples of oral history, cultural history, et cetera, et cetera, bone and uh, uh, antler tools and utilitarian uses going back for centuries or you know thousands of years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And when did you start um, using like that medium to create your work? Uh, maybe almost 15, 20 years ago or so, yeah. Yeah. And it's what you would probably, well, just like looking at your website, is that what you're kind of most interested in using is the deer antlers? It feels most right. Yeah. It's something that just kind of feels, feels right when I do it. So that's why I continue to do it. Man. Yeah. Awesome. Bonnie Anderson um, asked if you could repeat the names of the artists whose works you showed at the end of the PowerPoint. Yep, so the Jack in the Box was made by Samantha Jacobs. The Vessel with the Nun uh, was made by Peter B. Jones. There was a pen and ink drawn by Randy Spruce. There was a watercolor and acrylic and pen and ink um, by Luann Redeye. And then the digital art by uh, Tammy Watt. We actually have a Peter B. Jones in Action Abstraction Redefined, and I think it's the same artist, which is pretty neat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Jim and Jean said, we so appreciate this presentation and the conversation needs to continue so the, that we gain the knowledge we need to make change. The government needs to take major steps to promote necessary progress. Thank you so much. And Michelle Sweeney says, just visited Finland and this, uh, I'm probably not going to say this right, Sami people carve antlers and only shed antlers are used to do so. The people are very environmentally conscious. Does anyone else have any questions for Hayden? And again, I linked um, Hayden's website in the chat. Please feel free to check it out. It's it's really wonderful, the work Hayden does. How can we help with the healing? I was very touched by your presentation. That's from Sarah Blakely. <clears throat> now, that's a very global question, you know, but I think, um, and I don't have the right answer. Um, what I, and, and I don't know where, um, you're actually uh coming from in terms of where you live but you know 
again, I reference where I work a lot just because I get a lot of questions like that. Um, wherever people live, right, there's there's a history there that should be learned, you know. Sometimes it's done through these land acknowledgments. But, you know, if there's a nation close by to where you live that has a territory or where they've been displaced, but there's still people there and they have, like, grassroots organizations, stuff like that, I would, you know, I always encourage people to support those types of things, you know. Whatever's closest to you, you know, you can put a lot of time and effort into um, big organizations, but oftentimes, as you know, like any organ big organization, that does get felt in the actual community. I'm a community-minded type of person um, because I live in the community. So um, in that regard, yes. And also, you know, just, you know, supporting um, people who are making things, um, attending talks like this to, to, to learn indigenous perspectives. You know, a lot of this information is already out there. But it's sometimes it's, and it takes an indigenous perspective and not mine. I'm not saying I have it, but sometimes it takes that um, to uh, to um, really make something uh, make sense a little bit more. And going back to that common uh, common history, the common memory, you know, the more we work towards that, then the better, you know, as a relationship between uh, natives and non-natives can be, right? Because ultimately we are one community in this island this turtle island and so in order to you know move past this stuff we have to talk about this stuff and in my opinion you know um not talking about it doesn't fix anything just like not talking about you know your drinking problem that doesn't help your drinking problem you know what i mean or insert whatever uh, issue there has to ha come you know there has to be uh, both uh, conversation pieces you know mm -hmm. Bob Eret said, love this presentation. We need to keep this knowledge alive. What can we do to help? Which I think you've kind of touched on. Yeah, like I said, I don't really have, uh, you know, the right answer, but, you know, there's, I, I'm just about supporting the community and, and, lift, and hearing and uplifting uh, Indigenous voices is one way, you know. Oftentimes people, no matter what uh, networks they have, can make an impact. And that's, if it's one person, then that's, that's more than zero. Mm -hmm. Paula Smith says, I so enjoyed your enlightening presentation. Thank you for taking time to share your story. Your photos were beautiful. Your interest in art reminds me of Sheriff Bay's artwork, artistic work with African-American art because of your desire to pass down the heritage of your ancestry. And Dolores Tanglin said, I'm part of a group exploring reparations. We keep coming back to the principle of the place to start is by forming relationships with native people and communities. relationship to definitely I agree any other questions or comments for Hayden all right well thank you all so much for coming and again thank you so much Hayden for this beautiful presentation we're so happy you were able to join us um again I put Hayden's website um in our chat please check it out beautiful work and um, I just want to say as well, Action Abstraction, Modern Native Art, 1945 to 1975, just opened on February 26th, and it will be on view through May 28th, 2023. Um, so check out more of our programs that are coming up. And again, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, and we'll talk to you later. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.